Welcome, good evening, good afternoon, or good morning. I'm Dan Koritskis from Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School in Boston. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this new virtual workshop on the comprehensive clinical management of COVID-19. Over the next two days, we're going to present over across three sessions, a really uh, complete overview of contemporary management of this uh, extraordinary pandemic we, with which we've all been dealing. It's now my great pleasure to turn this over to my co-chair, uh, Anton Posniak of the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital in London, Anton. Thanks very much, Dan, and I'm looking forward to your uh, talk later on today. So um, I just wanted to go through the, uh, the learning objectives uh, for uh, this um, session now. Um, and so what we aim to do is to have a better understanding of the COVID-19 uh, clinical manifestations, obtain an updated understanding of the therapeutic options available today uh, and those in advanced clinical trials, and also be knowledgeable of the key aspects of clinical management of COVID-19 patients. So I, we really would like you to get involved. So please submit questions to the live Q&A. And also you can chat and connect to people through the meeting hub. And the other thing is, is that if you have any problems with, with uh, technical problems, you can ask for assistance by clicking the live support hub at the top uh, right hand side of your screen. Now your feedback's really important. So please fill out the session surveys and uh, participate in the general workshop, workshop evaluation after the event. You will get a certificate of attendance that will be sent by email upon the completion of this post-meeting survey. And we have applied to, for CME uh, and we hope to be able to uh, let you know about that uh, by tomorrow. So I'd really like to acknowledge our um, organizing committee um, and you can see that uh, Dan, uh, Jonathan Shapiro and Charles Boucher are the program directors and our fantastic organizing committee uh, that we have, uh, Renata Arrington Sanders uh, from Johns Hopkins in the United States, Monica Gandhi from the University of California in San Francisco from the United States, and we'll hear more from Monica today, Beatrice Greenstein uh, from Vanderbilt University Medical Center in uh, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, uh, Hongzhu Lu uh, from the Shanghai Public Health Clinical Center in from China, Vikram Mukherjee from Bellevue Hospital in the United States, and uh, uh, Francois Venter uh, from the University of the Witwatersrand in South Africa. So I'd like to acknowledge our uh, major sponsor, Gilead, um, for uh, their, their support, and um, but they've uh, provided part funding for this and uh, this is an independent medical education program and they've had no input into selection speakers or the content of the material or the presentations. There's also a special thank you to the following organizations which have helped us um, disseminate information about this meeting. And with that I'd like to hand over to our chair for session one, Professor Francois Venter, from the University of the Witwatersrand in South Africa. Francois, over to you. Thanks, Anton, and thanks everybody, and thanks to the organizing group. I think it's been a, a huge effort um, to, to bring this together. And we're very excited to bring together a stellar lineup in terms of COVID-19, everything you could possibly want to know, um, given by some of the best experts in the world. So looking forward to doing this with my co-chair, Monica Gandhi, who's hopefully going to join us a little bit later for the Q&A session. As Anton says, we're really keen for you to participate. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker today, um, who's Johan Netz, who's a um, very widely published um, virologist um, at the University of Leuven in, in Belgium, where he's, as I said, he has a stellar teaching and, and publishing career. Um, they've done some amazing work on vaccines um, and targets and, and drug targets against various um, um, viruses, including dengue, flavivirus, chikungunya, um, alpha viruses, enteroviruses, noroviruses, <laughs> HIV, and rabies. Not a single virus has escaped his, his view by the looks of things. So it's my absolute pleasure to hand over to you, Johan, and um, uh, and to hear what you have to say. 
Good evening, and uh, thank you so much for the uh, kind invitation. So the title of my talk is SARS-CoV-2 uh, Drug Targets for Therapeutic Intervention. And you will see that I will also uh, explain first um, on a couple of other viruses how we approach identifying novel targets for therapeutic intervention. You can find our website www.antivirus.be and you can find us also back on uh, Twitter, my lab and, uh, and myself. In September uh, 2019, I was in Wuhan. And here you see a picture that I took from the uh, Yangtze River. So it's a huge city, 11 million people, uh, also a modern city. Uh, and um, I was, I could not have imagined at the time that Wuhan would have been just a couple of months later, the epicenter of the next pandemic. And likely uh, the first viruses were circulating already at the time that I was in Wuhan. And I was, when I was giving my lecture, and of course, here on stage, that's not me, that's the organizer. I was explaining that the world is not ready and that we should prepare, that we should basically have broader acting antivirals uh, to make sure that we can uh, combat a new emerging virus at the time uh, that we see it appearing. It didn't happen, of course. Now, what do we have in terms of, of antivirals? Well, you know that we have drugs to treat herpes infections and Zoviax is one of it. HIV can be treated with just one pill a day, a combination uh, of different uh, therapeutics. Hepatitis C, quite a revolution in, in, in medicine. Today, hepatitis C can be cured, chronic hepatitis C, with just two or three months of uh, one or two pills a day, which is fantastic and shows what the potency can be of antivirals. Also, hepatitis B can be treated, not, not cured, but can be treated. And we have a couple of flu drugs, but we need uh, more flu drugs, as you will agree with me. But we do not have antivirals against all other viruses, including RSV and other paramyxoviruses, rhino and enteroviruses, uh, not against arena, not against bunya, not against corona. This is a slide that I use all the time, but since 2020 I put corona in green, not against flavis, not against alpha viruses, not against anything. And, and Bill Gates said, back five years ago in a TED talk, if anything kills over 10 million people in the next few decades, it's most likely to be a highly infectious virus rather than a war. And he also said that we're not ready for the next epidemic, for the next pandemic. And I think he was right. So let me just quickly remind you of the beautiful mechanism of action of the anti-herpes drugs, uh, drug is cyclovir. Um, so this was discovered by Trudy Elion, and I had the uh, the chance to know uh, Trudy a little bit. And so this is an acyclic nucleoside analog. It is when taken up in the cell, in the infected cell, phosphorylated by the herpes simplex timidine kinase to the monophosphate, and then further to the diphosphate and the triphosphate. And it is a triphosphate which is then recognized by the herpes uh, polymerase and incorporated into the growing DNA chain. It is not incorporated into the um, into the cellular DNA, so you have a double selectivity. The phosphorylation does only happen in the infected cell, and it's only incorporated into the herpes viral DNA. So a beautiful mechanism of action. Sometimes, if you treat patients for a long time, for example, transplant patients, you may have mutations in the timeline kinase. Then you don't have a buildup of the monophosphate, di and triphosphate, and so now inhibition of viral replication. And so in the Riga Institute here. Uh, my uh, mentor, so quite some time ago now, together with the chemist uh, Anthony Holy in, in Prague, uh, developed a nucleoside analog that has already this phosphate, but now it's a phosphonate, so a stable linkage, so that you can bypass this first phosphorylation step. And so this compound, HPMPC or cytophavir, is taken up in cells phosphorylated to the monophosphate to the diphosphate, and the diphosphate is then kind of a triphosphate. This is then recognized by the herpes and other DNA virus polymerases and incorporated into the growing DNA chain. Now this makes a difference for patients because here, for example, you see an anorectal uh, herpes simplex type 2 infection in a transplant patient uh, that was not reactive or reacting to a cyclovir therapy, so a very painful lesion. And you can see that after two doses and four doses of um, cytophavir, that lesion has healed. So just to explain you what a um, phosphorylation step can, can do, or lack of a phosphorylation step can do. Um, to the same family of these phosphonates belongs uh, tenofovir. Tenofovir, as, as you may know, 
the uh, most widely used anti-HIV drug in the world, the cornerstone of a lot of, of uh, combination therapies. And as it prudric uh, TAF, which is an alafinamide prudric, it's taken up in the cell and then converted to tenofovir, which is then phosphorylated to diphosphate, which is actually a triphosphate, um, uh, and, uh, and which is then incorporated into the uh, growing DNA chain uh, by the reverse transcriptase and also stops uh, DNA, um, DNA synthesis. Many more antiviral drugs around, and I don't have the time, of course, uh, and it's also not the, uh, the aim to explain that. But just to, uh, so this is a website of my lab, a screenshot, and just to explain that we work on this, on several viruses for which we don't have uh, drugs. Um, for example, flavor viruses, I give you an example of dengue, picorina viruses, I give you also uh, an example, uh, chikungunya, and of course, I'll uh, then come back to, uh, to corona. So dengue, I don't have to explain you that dengue is a problematic uh, virus uh, present in all uh, tropical and subtropical uh, areas in the world. And every minute there is one person being hospitalized because of dengue and roughly 96 million cases of dengue uh, happen each year, which may overwhelm hospitals. And you see here a picture that I took when um, uh, in, in Vietnam of a boy with dengue hemorrhagic uh, fever. There is no drug to treat uh, dengue. There is a uh, dengvaxia, the vaccine, but as we know, also there are some issues with uh, dengvaxia. And just to give you an example of how we work to, uh, to try to identify novel inhibitors, so one of the approaches that we like, besides uh, structure-based drug design, is phenotypic screening and picking up heat compounds and then work with the chemist to optimize the heat compounds and in the end hopefully have an interesting class of compounds. So in this case, we worked with the Center for Drug Design in Leuven. We tested uh, roughly 60,000 compounds, picked up a couple of hits, and then worked on some of the hits and identified the best class uh, for this uh, program. So we optimized with the uh, team of CD3 and ended up with, uh, and I must say this was after 2000 analogs had been synthesized, ended up with a pan type compound, very potent, even picomolar potencies, and also active against clinical isolates, because of course a drug should not only be active against lab isolates. But then the whole thing is, I mean, how do such compounds act? And then we select for resistance, see where the mutations are. In this case, we found mutations are in NS4B. We put the mutations back into the wild app, clone, see if they confer resistance, which was the case um, here. And then you have identified, in this case, a new target for inhibition of viral uh, replication, the uh, flavor virus NS4B. What we also do is, of course, then try to assess if these uh, drugs are active in animal models. In this case, we use AG129 mice infected with dengue. You can see that this uh, mouse is sick because of dengue if it received placebo and this mouse has been treated with inhibitor and is uh, protected against infection. But so we identified NS4B as an excellent target for um, blocking dengue and flavor virus replication. And this, of course, cannot be further developed within an um, university, so you need a partnership with a company. In this case, this uh, has been licensed to Janssen Pharmaceutica and it's now in further development at Janssen. Another example is uh, chikungunya. As you know, we don't have uh, a vaccine, we don't have drugs against uh, chikungunya. And you can see this lady here, a young and otherwise healthy lady, how badly she's suffering from, um, uh, from uh, chikungunya. So we thought also that we should develop. So another example is here this on chikungunya and we work with uh, another chemist, Maria Jesus Perez Perez in Madrid and we identified together with Maria Jesus a class of compounds and just show one example here, one um, member of this uh, class of compounds, a class of triazolopyrimidine onus, uh, which block chikungunya and other alpha viruses. We published that a couple of years ago. And uh, again, the question was, how do they act? So we select for resistance. We found a mutation in NS1. So NS1 is responsible for the capping machinery. And then we found together also with Bruno Canari in Marseille that the methylation of the cap is blocked by this compound. You can see this also on this blot. So also by uh, f identifying any hit in a phenotypic screen a new compound, we could identify a new mechanism by which you can block chikungunya replication. Another example is with a chemist in India, Jaya Prakash van Kattesan, and we identified this uh, compound and, and analogs, and we found 
that it acts at entry and that it protects the capsid against heating um, and that it is not cross resistant with uh, other capsid binders you may know for example uh, Preconeril. With Sarah Butcher and Helsinki uh, we could demonstrate that the compound is binding in the, um, in the capsid at a particular uh, position um, and I show you this little uh, animation here so you see that um, the structure is and that's coming so that the compound is fitting exactly here in a pocket a pocket that was not known uh, before and is stabilizing the capsid and by doing so prevents the virus from getting into the cell so another example of a phenotypic screen that yielded a compound that is active that we optimized and that allows us to identify a novel target in the replication cycle of enteriviruses and we have many more examples but I just um, show you these to demonstrate also where we want to go on coronaviruses. So we, uh, we screened so far against uh, SARS-CoV-2 1.6 million compounds uh, and it's indeed looking for the needle in the haystack whereby the haystack is the infected cell and the needle is then the hit that you would like to identify within this infected cell. And for SARS-CoV-2 we use um, GFP labeled cells in 3A to 4 well plates. If we add the virus, the uh, virus is killing the, uh, the cells. And if you add a compound, for example, here in green, uh, these are wells in which remdesivir has been added. You see that remdesivir, the anti um, uh, SARS CoV 2 and Ebola compound of Gilead, is blocking the uh, replication of the virus, is just protecting the cells. Of course, if you test so many compounds, you cannot have your uh, people in the lab sitting there pipetting day and night. So you need to do that automatically. So a couple of years ago, we uh, built a high biosafety lab in a box. So in blue, this is a box of about uh, 45 cube um, and attached to it is a glove box system, which is again uh, then attached to a walk-in high biosafety lab. On top of that, you see all the air handling and in gray, you see the uh, incubators. Uh, you can find a movie. A video on the website of uh, my lab www.antivirus.pe and I'll show you the next slide a uh, short uh, video of them as it looks now so here you see the, the box you see the robot arm in the box you see with the blue lid two high content images that we use to read the, uh, the plates and so on what you see now is the uh, robotic arm that is taking a place in the background you see a deleter active um, so the robotic arm uh, is now putting a plate and puts this plate in a barcode uh, reader um, and then the software is um, makes that the robot arm goes to the high content image takes a plate that has been read there and puts this again at, uh, at another position so the whole system is built up in double each equipment in the box is in double just in case that one piece of equipment would fail that we still have a backup and here you see another robot arm that is putting a plate in an incubator we have four such incubators um, and so a couple of days later uh, the software knows that it has to take the plate out and then has to put the plate on the uh, uh, on the high content imager for example on uh, or on another instrument so by this um, we can uh, run day and night, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, a lot of compounds and uh, do a lot of phenotypic screening and come up with uh, new hits which we then uh, can be optimized. So indeed the uh, SARS-CoV-2 replication cycle in the, uh, in the cell, we know a couple of, of uh, targets, we know the viral uh, polymerase of course which is the target of remdesivir and some other compounds we know the viral protease uh, we and others have been working on the viral protease of coronaviruses um, now looking at the replication cycle there's first the attachment you have the ACE2 and then you have the uh, TRIMS2 the um, surface uh, serine uh, protease which is essential in the uptake which is also a uh, potential uh, target um, there are various steps and various interactions between proteins, um, proteins uh, of SARS-CoV-2 with, with other viral proteins, but also interactions with uh, host cell uh, proteins, uh, enzymatic um, steps that can be blocked. But it's 
I said it's a, a big black box. It's um, looking if you do a screening for the needle in the haystack, but you can identify if you screen sufficient number of compounds, interesting hits and interesting classes of compounds. Just back to uh, remdesivir for a minute. So this compound was um, developed as a Ebola compound and was then um, found also back in 2018 uh, to be active against uh, coronaviruses. Uh, but that's of course not a very potent compound. It hasn't been not been developed to be a highly potent compound of coronas, but at least was sort of the first compound that could be used, the first drug that, drug that could be used. And in clinical studies, it was uh, shown that at least it causes a uh, in hospitalized patients, a reduction in the duration in the hospital, and it's approved in the EU, um, for example, for use in patients uh, with COVID that require oxygen. But then in a, the solidarity trial uh, by the WHO, there was no activity identified, but I think that the last word has not yet uh, been said about the use of remdesivir in, uh, in COVID. Well, in our drug uh, development efforts for COVID and other viruses, we also use these human airway epithelial cells at the air liquid interface. So um, we put these cultures and we get them from epithelics at the uh, air liquid interface. We add the drug at the basolateral side and infect the, uh, the cells and the cultures from the top. What you see, and this is here on the, on the x-axis, the time in days, on the y-axis, uh, the CT uh, values. Um, and what you see is that after infection, after a couple of days, we see that viral replication is going up. Uh, and we add the compound, in this case, the parent compound of remdesivir uh, for nine days. That's a gray box. And then you see a 10 micromolar. This is the purple uh, triangles that it blocks completely replication of the virus. And even if you take the drug away, the um, virus is not coming back. Of course, drugs should not be toxic. And we look also at cilia beating. So you see in infected cultures, untreated in red, that cilia beating goes down. So the cultures are suffering. If we add the compound in purple, you see that cilia beating is still normal. So it's protecting against infection and it is not toxic. Next thing is, of course, to uh, test the uh, drugs in, in animal models, and we developed the hamster model. Um, we published that model in Nature Communications and also use it into a recent uh, PNAS uh, paper. If we infect the hamsters intranasally, you see that after one day, two, three, four days, that you reach a lot of virus in the lungs. Um, and this goes really fast and rapid, and you see that uh, by day four in the lungs that you have clear pathology as uh, this is here, an uninfected lung, a clear pathology that resembles uh, somehow COVID in people. Um, we also put the animals in a uh, CT scan, a micro CT scan. You see here the uh, lungs of uninfected hamsters, and you can clearly see in infected hamsters that uh, there's, uh, there are lesions in the lungs. So also this can be used to assess efficacy of compounds, and of course also of vaccines. Now you um, all heard about hydroxychloroquine that it would be uh, effective in the end. I think it's clear from clinical studies that it is not effective against uh, COVID. Uh, it was also said that azithromycin in combination with hydroxychloroquine would be effective. Also that I think has been shown not to be the case. Unfortunately, of course, at the time, beginning of the pandemic, that uh, new um, studies had to be, or studies had to be set up, clinical studies. Uh, we, ha we are not, as had not yet an animal model to assess that, but I will show you in a minute that hydroxychloroquine is not effective. We, we are looking for other compounds, and for example, we identified that uh, favipiravir, which is a Japanese flu compound, that that is uh, acting at least a little bit in cell culture against SARS-CoV-2. And uh, this compound is a, a small molecule, a kind of nucleobase, which is then taken up in the cell and converted to a nucleoside, actually a nucleotide analog. And this, so favipiravir, uh, triphosphate um, um, is then blocking the polymerase of influenza and of other viruses, and likely this also of uh, coronaviruses. So we wanted to test this compound in the hamster model. So hamsters were um, infected and treated with the compound for four uh, days, and at four days after infection, at the peak, viral load in the lungs, they were treated with uh, different doses of favipiravir, and with hydroxychloroquine, here in blue, 
or the uh, half blue, half white circles with hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin. Now, as you can see, um, in, uh, in gray are the titers and the lungs. These are the 50 per milligram of, of lung tissue, very high titers of uh, virus and the lung. Now, if you look at uh, animals that have been treated with a very high dose um, of, of favipiravir, but they can they, they tolerate that quite well, you can see that the um, that, that we do not find infectious virus back in the lungs of these animals, of most of the animals. If you look at hydroxychloroquine, either alone or combined with azithromycin, you see that there is no inhibition. So if you had known in April, in March, April, that hydroxychloroquine is not active in the hamster model, likely they should not have started the, uh, all these studies with hydroxychloroquine in humans. Another setup of the experiment is to see if we give the drug prophylactically to sentinels that we place in the same box with index hamsters, if that would protect the sentinels. So again, we put the animals together, the sentinels have been treated, and then four days after we put them together, we check the content of the virus, uh, the viral content in the lungs of these animals. So again, on the y-axis with the full circles, you see the tighter in the lungs of, um, of untreated uh, index animals. With open circles are the titers in the sentinels that have not been treated. But you see that all sentinels become infected. Some have a lot of virus in the lungs. Some have just a little bit of virus in the lung, but they all become infected in contact with the sentinels. Now look in red at the sentinels that have received the open circles that have received uh, favipiravir prophylactically. So you can see that we do not find any infectious virus back in the lungs of these animals. This is in contrast to hydroxychloroquine. So you have to compare the open blue circles with the open gray circles. So the sentinels, untreated sentinels, and those treated with, uh, with hydroxychloroquine, there is no difference. So also there in prophylaxis, hydroxychloroquine here does not offer any protection. So you could consider, for example, favipiravir in a household prophylaxis, or for example, in long-term care facilities where some patients have been uh, infected and others not yet, so you could then prophylactically treat those not yet infected. Very recent data that I did not uh, present yet um, until recently is the activity of hydroxycytidine, N4-hydroxycytidine, and the isopropyl ester of that compound, also named molnupiravir. So we've, we have noticed found that this compound inhibits replication of SARS-CoV-2, and so also here we gave it uh, orally to, to hamsters and we infected them in the nose and then uh, treated them for a couple of days and again at day four looked at the content of the virus in the lung. So here in blue are the infectious titers in the lungs of the untreated or the placebo treated animals. So you see a huge viral load. If we treat them with a lower dose of 50, 75 milligram per kick of the compound, you see a reduction. But clearly, at a higher dose, at 200 mg per kick, you see a very significant reduction of viral RNA. And this is even more pronounced if we look at the levels of infectious virus in the lung. Even in some animals, we do not have infectious viral uh, virus, which is roughly 5 log reduction. Also, when we look in panel D at the lung score, as scored by the pathologist, there is clear, clearly an effect. Um, and uh, the drug molnupiravir is well tolerated, you do see that there is uh, no reduction in, in body weight of the, uh, of the animals. Finally, uh, it's also not just about small molecules, but it's also about um, antibodies. And you know that a couple of companies have antibodies in development, and we worked together in this case with uh, VIR and HUMAPS, um, and so they developed ultra-potent um, antibodies, so we tested those in the hamster model, you can see here again that in the in gray, that in uninfected hamsters, that we do see a lot of virus in the lung. In hamsters that have been treated with one milligram per kilogram of the um, of the um, of the antibodies, that we can completely block that. For example, here in yellow, uh, animals have been treated with uh, half a milligram per kilogram with two uh, different antibodies, and uh, most of them are indeed uh, protected uh, with this cocktail. So I um, have to thank a lot of people, a lot of people who have been working really hard in the last uh, couple of, of months. Um, I have to thank uh, also the uh, funding bodies, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, 
Paris in 2020, the FWO, uh, the KU Leuven, and all the uh, all the people that donated to the COVID funds of the uh, of the KU Leuven. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Johan, for that incredible overview of the field. I think we're starting to realize why we've made so much progress in terms of drugs and vaccines um, in such an amazingly short time when we have such incredible basic science depth um, in people like you. Um, our next speaker um, needs no introduction to, to many of us. I think he's been an inspiration um, in the HIV treatment and, and resistance world for, for the longest time. Um, Dan Karitskis is the Harriet Ryan LB Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases at the Brigham in Boston in Massachusetts. Um, he, he is extensively published on antiretroviral therapy and drug resistance, um, has chaired multiple um, studies on HIV therapy, previously chaired the ACTG, um, and has served as a member of the NIH Office of AIDS, uh, of AIDS Research Advisory Council, and finally as a member of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Panel on Guidelines for Antiretroviral Therapy. Um, Dan is going to, uh, has managed to pivot more recently, and I think this year has been a regular check-in for many of us, in terms of novel and new antiretroviral therapies for COVID-19, which he's going to address on, um, uh, he's going to be talking to about us just this evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Over to you, Dan. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be speaking uh, with you today on antiviral therapy for COVID-19. In my talk, I'm going to speak specifically about drugs that directly uh, act on SARS-CoV-2. You will hear later in the program about the use of corticosteroids and anti-inflammatory agents, uh, so I'll be narrowing the focus of my talk uh, in the current session. These are my disclosures. And particularly, I'll talk about uh, three topics, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase inhibitors, or RDRP inhibitors, monoclonal antibodies, and other drugs. Convalescent plasma will also be covered in a separate talk uh, later in the program. This slide shows the RDRP inhibitors that are currently in clinical trials for treatment of COVID-19. Of course, the one of these that is furthest along is remdesivir, which now has uh, FDA approval in the United States and is approved for a use in different ways uh, in various countries around the world, and I'll spend much of my time talking about remdesivir today. There are also several other drugs in various uh, uh, earlier stages of clinical trials, including molnupiravir, uh, which is being developed by Merck, uh, favipiravir, uh, which is actually in phase three uh, in Japan, uh, but hasn't made as much progress elsewhere, and then AT527, which is in phase two trials currently and is anticipated to enter phase three trials soon. There's also gal galadesivir, uh, which is just in early phase studies in Brazil. I won't be saying much about these other uh, uh, four drugs and because of their early stage and because not very much data has been presented publicly about them and really focus now on remdesivir. Remdesivir has uh, had several different clinical trials reported uh, over the last uh, six to eight months. And that starts with this uh, study published in The Lancet earlier this year of a double-blind placebo-controlled trial conducted in Wuhan in which uh, people with COVID-19 were randomized two to one to receive remdesivir versus placebo. The primary outcome was time to clinical improvement by day 28. Now, because of the timing of this trial, uh, was initiated just as the epidemic was coming under control in Wuhan. Uh, the study only enrolled a, a little more than half of the anticipated uh, complete enrollment, dramatically reducing the power of the study to find differences between the treatment arms. You'll notice then that there really was no significant difference in the cumulative improvement rate between the remdesivir and control arms. And interestingly, nor was there any difference uh, in the antiviral activity uh, uh, or the rate of viral clearance, either in the upper respiratory tract or the lower respiratory tract of remdesivir as compared to control. Now, by contrast, in, a, in an uncontrolled observational study in patients who received remdesivir under a compassionate use authorization uh, in the United States, we see cum uh, pooled data uh, that show that there was a cumulative incidence of improvement uh, of, of, of where half the uh, 
patients improved by about day 16 or 17 uh, in, in this experience overall. Now that's notable because at the same time, the time, uh, the, the days to improvement for people not receiving uh, com uh, compassionate use remdesivir was really substantially longer. And this difference is most notable uh, in panel B for those who were receiving uh, invasive oxygen support, meaning mechanical ventilation. There, the median time to improvement was about uh, 20 days, uh, whereas uh, in fact, uh, I'm sorry, this is the, um, uh, that's right, the median time to improvement was 20 days uh, at a time when uh, uh, really only about 30% of people not receiving remdesivir uh, were, uh, who had uh, been intubated were uh, surviving at all. But these are not randomized trial data. For that, we need to turn to the ACT-1 study, uh, the first uh, truly uh, randomized trial of uh, remdesivir to be reported. This was a placebo-controlled double-blind trial in hospitalized adults with COVID-19 pneumonia. Uh, participants were randomized equally to remdesivir or placebo, and the primary endpoint was time to recovery uh, within 28 days. And the preliminary analysis was performed after just a, a over 600 uh, recoveries were attained. What you can see in panel A, uh, looking at uh, the overall results, is that there was a statistically significant reduction in time to recovery uh, for the remdesivir recipients uh, versus those in the placebo arm, and that was about a three to four day uh, faster recovery. This was most notable in uh, patients who were already receiving supplemental oxygen as illustrated in panel C, uh, but uh, not statistically significant in those uh, who were not receiving oxygen. By contrast, there was really no difference at all uh, for people who were already receiving either high flow oxygen or mechanical ventilation uh, as uh, supportive therapy. And this is a finding that gets uh, carried forward in several uh, subsequent trials that I'll talk about now. In the subsequent, uh, in a subgroup analysis for ACT-1, you can see that uh, the, um, uh, here's the overall benefit. Uh, there was no real difference by geographic region, uh, not uh, much difference by uh, ethnicity either. Um, uh, and then uh, uh, if you look by age, clearly the younger patients had a greater benefit than older patients, but there was still benefit in older patients, no difference by gender. Uh, there was some suggestion perhaps of a slight difference that people treated earlier had a, a better improvement than those uh, treated later. Uh, and clearly those receiving oxygen had the biggest uh, effect, whereas there was no benefit for those receiving mechanical ventilation. Now, the simple trial was actually two different studies, one done in severe disease and one done in people with mild to moderate disease. And these were both studies, randomized trials that were uh, conducted by uh, Gilead. The study in severe disease did not include a control group. It was a randomized comparison of a short course or five days of remdesivir versus longer course or 10 days of remdesivir as you see illustrated here. The major eligibility criteria were uh, diagnosis of SARS-CoV-2 by PCR, presence of pulmonary infiltrates uh, and an oxygen requirement uh, necessary to maintain uh, O2 sats of 94% uh, uh, or, um, uh, or less. Uh, and, but patients could not be uh, receiving mechanical ox uh, ventilation or ECMO. This slide summarized the principal results. Uh, again, remember there's no control group. So we're just looking at uh, uh, clinical status at day 14, time to improvement uh, and time to recovery. Uh, and you can see uh, that there are no differences between uh, the groups for any of these endpoints. The, these data were then compared to a contemporaneous cohort of individuals at other centers not participating in the remdesivir trials uh, to see whether there were differences in outcome, uh, first starting with time to recovery or the proportion who recovered uh, at day 14. Uh, about three quarters of those who were in, were in the remdesivir cohort had recovered by day 14 compared to just 60% in the non-remdesivir cohort, and that was statistically significant. Uh, also looking at mortality by day 14, you can see that mortality in the remdesivir group was about 7.5% versus 12.5% in the non-remdesivir cohort, again, a statistically significant difference. But these were not randomized trials, and although uh, there were uh, attempts to control as best they could uh, differences between these populations, uh, still uh, these data, while supportive, are, are not definitive. 
the study in moderate disease was a placebo-controlled trial. Uh, this uh, simple trial uh, was three arms, again, uh, two arms comparing five days versus 10 days of remdesivir, but then including uh, a placebo uh, standard of care arm. Uh, and um, uh, this uh, study likewise required uh, documentation of SARS-CoV-2 by PCR, but here, uh, uh, patients or participants entering the trial had to be able to maintain an oxygen saturation of greater than 94% on no more than two liters of oxygen. 600 participants were enrolled initially, and here the primary endpoint was clinical status at day 11. And the five-day arm showed a, a statistically significant uh, greater improvement uh, compared to the standard of care. We can look at those results in more detail on this slide here. You can see that, uh, first of all, this slide is showing the distribution by uh, ordinal rank of various uh, outcomes where the best outcome is being discharged, shown in the palest color uh, in the top of these bars, and the worst outcome is in the darkest color uh, here shown in black uh, at the bottom of the, the bars. At day 11, the distribution of outcomes was more favorable with the five-day remdesivir group compared to the standard of care group, and that was statistically significant, but not so for the 10-day group, which is somewhat puzzling. By day 14, however, both groups uh, showed statistically significant uh, differences compared to the standard of care. And then at, by day 28, the 10-day group, but not the five-day group, had a statistically significant benefit, although the five-day group uh, is uh, trending towards significance. Now those data have to be uh, countered by the solidarity study, uh, which was a study uh, conducted uh, uh, by the WHO uh, Solidarity Trial Consortium uh, and which has been uh, posted on MedArchive but not yet uh, peer reviewed. Uh, this study had a more uh, general uh, uh, entry criteria. Participants had to be hospitalized adults with COVID-19 and they could not have received a study drug. They were randomized into different arms depending on what therapies they might or might not have uh, already been receiving. The primary endpoint here is in-hospital mortality, whereas secondary endpoints were a progression to mechanical ventilation and the duration of hospitalization. You can see that about a quarter of the participants did not require any oxygen at entry and so would perhaps have been comparable to the um, uh, participants studied in the a mild to moderate disease simple uh, trial. Uh, two thirds required oxygen at entry uh, and already about 10% required mechanical ventilation. This study results showed absolutely no difference in overall mortality between the control and the remdesivir uh, groups. And this was true uh, whether stratified by age uh, or by uh, participants who did or, uh, or were not already uh, uh, requiring ventilation uh, at the time of uh, enrollment. In a meta-analysis that also uh, looked at other trials data, uh, you can see that uh, the uh, overall uh, benefit of remdesivir was found to be really quite marginal and not statistically uh, significant. Uh, this was true for both the low and high risk groups, although there's more of a suggestion of a benefit uh, in the lower risk group, not already uh, ventilated, uh, and was true uh, in the solidarity study, the uh, ACT study, except for those requiring low flow O2, where there was clearly a benefit, uh, and then in the Wuhan and simple trials. So these data have led to the following recommendations from the United States uh, Department of uh, Health and Human Services uh, Treatment Guidelines Panel for COVID-19. For patients with mild or moderate COVID-19, they feel there's insufficient data to recommend uh, either for or against the use of remdesivir in patients uh, with mild uh, and moderate COVID-19. Those who require low flow supplemental oxygen uh, should receive uh, remdesivir, but five days would be sufficient or until hospital discharge. There's no need to uh, keep patients in the hospital longer just to complete a course of, of remdesivir if they are already improving. And then for patients who require oxygen delivery through high flow devices, non-invasive ventilation or mechanical ventilation and ECMO, there's uncertainty regarding whether starting remdesivir confers a clinical benefit, and the panel cannot make a recommendation either for or against starting remdesivir. I should say that the WHO has come out with a recommendation uh, suggesting that there are inadequate data to support uh, the routine use of remdesivir in the treatment of COVID-19. Well, let's turn now to a discussion of monoclonal, monoclonal neutralizing antibodies. 
Human monoclonal antibodies are able to neutralize SARS-CoV-2, and they generally target the S or spike protein. These uh, uh, antibodies can, of course, be genetically engineered to combine multiple specificities uh, within a single antibody by having different combinatorial domains, or by modifying the FC receptor to extend the half-life in the same way that modifications have been introduced into broadly neutralizing antibodies for uh, HIV. Now, these antibodies, therefore, have potential utility for both treatment and prevention of COVID-19. The first of these antibodies to be discussed is the LY-CoV-555 antibody from Lilly, now formally known as bamlanivimab. This uh, antibody has been studied in the BLAZE-1 trial, which was a placebo-controlled phase two trial of symptomatic outpatients with COVID-19. This antibody was studied both by itself and in combination with a second antibody, LY-CoV-016. The primary endpoint in BLAZE-1 was the change in viral load endpoint at day 11, and this was met uh, in the middle dose group, the 2800 milligram dose group, but curiously not for the lower or higher dose groups. In addition, uh, emergency room visits and hospitalizations uh, were lower in the uh, participants who received monoclonal antibody at any of the doses, uh, uh, just about one and a half percent, uh, compared to 6% in the placebo group, although as a secondary endpoint, these uh, differences were not uh, analyzed statistically uh, in the trial. There was no study uh, drug-related dr serious adverse events reported, uh, and but there were viruses with putative resistance mutations that emerged in eight treated and six placebo participants, so not clear if those were being selected by antibody or even by perhaps by the host's own evolving immune response. Additional trials uh, are ongoing, although at the present time, there's no plan for uh, bamlanivimab itself uh, to be uh, studied in randomized phase three trials or to advance to uh, registration on, uh, as a single antibody therapy. This slide shows more details from the BLAZE-1 trial, uh, particularly of the combination studies. So first, you can see in these uh, different uh, shades of green, the, the uh, dashed lines show the change in virus load for the low, medium, and high doses of uh, bamlanivimab. Uh, and recall only the middle dose achieved statistical significance uh, at uh, day 11, uh, but there is clearly a, a reduction in all of the groups, but there's also a reduction in the control uh, 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 in the uh, placebo arm shown here. A greater reduction was found in the combination antibody uh, arm of this study, uh, but we don't have any data for LY-CoV-016 on its own, uh, so we can't formally say whether this greater reduction is due in, to the, the combination per se, or might have been uh, elicited uh, solely by better activity of the second antibody. Looking at um, the change in symptom score at day 11, uh, we see that each of the uh, uh, single uh, dose, uh, each of the antibodies, uh, I'm sorry, each of the dosages of the single antibody, bamlanivimab, was associated with a stati statistically significant reduction in symptom score by day 11. Uh, and that was true then, of course, of all the doses pooled. Uh, and there was a, a numerically greater uh, reduction in that score for the combination. Um, but there isn't apparently much correlation between the magnitude of uh, virus load reduction and the symptom score change. Now, a second uh, pair of antibodies that are being studied is, uh, are those from Regeneron. Uh, uh, these are the Regeneron CoV-2 monoclonal antibody uh, cocktail uh, made up of uh, the combination of uh, casarivimab and imdevimab being studied in a seamless uh, phase one, two, three uh, trial design. Uh, to date, uh, data have been reported on 275 outpatients who uh, were randomized to receive either eight grams or 8,000 uh, milligrams or uh, 2.4 grams of the combination uh, antibodies uh, versus placebo. Uh, th uh, this is the uh, antibody combination that uh, Donald Trump received uh, uh, during his uh, uh, um, uh, hospital admission for uh, COVID-19 a couple of months ago. What you can see is that both doses uh, result in a significantly greater uh, reduction in the, uh, by re, uh, in the recovery of uh, virus uh, uh, by uh, swab compared to uh, placebo. Uh, and then looking at the proportion of subjects with uh, hospitalization or emergency room uh, visits, uh, we can see that uh, 
in the uh, study overall, uh, only 4% of placebo participants uh, uh, required an ER visit or hospitalization, and that was reduced by half to 2%, so uh, small numbers and modest differences. If you focus more specifically on those at high risk, uh, this is generally uh, people who are age 65 and older with uh, one or more comorbidities, we can see that the hospitalization rates or ER visits were more frequent at 9%, uh, and the um, incidence uh, in the treatment arms was reduced by uh, two thirds. So suggestion of benefit, but not definitive evidence. So numerous uh, SARS-CoV-2 monoclonal antibodies have been produced. Uh, these MABs uh, reduce virus load, uh, may pr uh, protect against infection and reduce lung injury in animal models. Several human clinical trials are ongoing uh, for treatment and now for pre prevention. And the preliminary data of phase one, two trials of uh, the uh, Lilly antibody bamlanivimab and the Regeneron uh, cocktail uh, are encouraging with no safety concerns to date. And both of these uh, uh, agents, uh, the Lilly single antibody and the Regeneron combination antibodies have received emergency use authorization uh, in the United States. But phase three data are really needed to demonstrate clinical efficacy because the benefits demonstrated to date are really quite modest, and we really don't know if they would hold up if uh, studied in larger populations. Let me finish just by uh, very briefly mentioning uh, uh, three other agents. Uh, first, two drugs that we know for certain do not work. Hydroxychloroquine, although touted uh, by many people as a potential uh, antiviral uh, agent uh, at the outset of the pandemic has definitively been proven in study after study to have absolutely no benefit and potentially to have uh, some uh, uh, trend towards uh, harm. Uh, similarly, despite favorable in vitro data, uh, there are now several clinical trials that show no benefit for uh, lopinavir or lopinavir uh, boosted by ritonavir. Uh, and we know that other protease inhibitors likewise uh, show uh, little evidence for any activity in vitro. Unknown is the potential activity of uh, the, the Temper SS2 inhibitor, Camostat. Uh, uh, Temper SS2 is a uh, host uh, protease that's necessary for processing the spike protein to allow uh, virus entry. Uh, and it, 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 it can be inhibited by Camostat, which is a drug already approved in some countries for treatment of uh, pancreatitis. You can see in these data from this uh, cell paper by Hoffman et al. that uh, uh, Camostat is able to inhibit the uh, entry of uh, pseudoviruses expressing the SARS-CoV-2 uh, spike protein as shown uh, here. It likewise inhibits SARS-CoV-1. But note that this inhibition is only about uh, 50%. Uh, and that's because other proteases, other uh, host proteases, notably uh, cathepsin B and cathepsin L, uh, can also process the spike protein. And it's only when both uh, uh, proteases or all three of those proteases actually are inhibited uh, that you see full inhibition of virus entry. So uh, while there are uh, ongoing trials of Camostat, most notably at the present time, the Camelot trial, uh, it's unclear to my mind whether there's really much reason to suspect a, a substantial uh, clinical benefit uh, from this drug. But as always, the clinical trials will tell. So with that, I uh, thank you and turn this back to our moderators. Thank you so much, Dan, for a characteristic comprehensive overview of the field. I think that we have lots of questions in the Q&A session. Just again, to tell people, please type your questions in um, so that we can put it to the panel at the end of, the, of this talk. Um, our next speaker is um, attached to Rasmus University in, in Holland. Um, Dr. Bart Rangers is an associate prof professor in infectious diseases at the university. I mean, he works on a bewildering number of infections, um, including invasive diseases associated with hematological disease and immunosuppression. He's done plenty of work on HIV, including side effects of antiretrovirals, but he also has had a focus on, on, on hepatitis C. Um, and has, in, has initiated multiple multi, um, multi-center trials throughout the Netherlands. Um, he's going to be talking to us on the thorny issue of convalescent plasma for COVID-19. Over to you. Um, good morning or good afternoon. Um, I'm Bart Reinders, an infectious disease physician from 
the Erasmus University Hospital in Rotterdam, and I'm gonna try to inform you about uh, the current knowledge of convalescent plasma for COVID-19, and if we should or should not, should not use it. For the few of you that are not aware of the plasma as treatment, um, some um, 17 years ago, there was SARS-CoV-1. Uh, this was uh, really a more deadly disease with a 9% mortality. Um, and in this context, um, physicians have used convalescent plasma. So plasma with antibodies um, from recovered patients. And they seem to observe a, a positive effect. Uh, but these were really small observational trials. Uh, so the evidence is, is absolutely inconclusive. But this was the reason why it uh, was uh, soon being used in the current pandemic. And um, uh, rapidly after, um, some physicians started to use uh, plasma, they also reported on it. Um, and I, I just want to illustrate this with a few publications that I, uh, I think are unfortunately very biased. Um, this one, for instance, reported uh, the results of 10 patients treated with convalescent plasma, and they compared the results with 10 historical controls. And uh, the good news in this um, in this study, or what was presented as the good news, is that um, antibodies increased after plasma transfusion, which I think is uh, something that what we would all expect, because if you have an infection, antibodies will increase over time anyway. Um, and what was uh, yeah. Really good. What is good to know is that the, the antibody titers at baseline in these patients were already really very high, much higher than what you see in plasma donors. Um, and then later on, some months ago now, there were um, these results that were published on the preprint server uh, that actually led to the uh, authorization of use of plasma in the US uh, by the FDA. Um, and this was also an observational study without the control group where they used data from 35,000 patients that had been treated with plasma um, outside the context of a study and to try to, to, to find uh, data in support of plasma uh, on outcome. They compared the patients that received plasma within three days after diagnosis uh, with those that received plasma later on. And they found, uh, they, they found an, uh, a benefit of early plasma compared with late plasma. And they also uh, did another observation, which I think is, is, is more interesting. Uh, and that was sort of those uh, response effects where higher titers seem to do better. But again, there was no control group, no real control group that did not receive plasma and there are several reasons why it is not unlikely that there is a bias in in this study just to give one example example but several examples are possible um, if you have a, a good health insurance and you um, will therefore be able to be tested sooner and to be hospitalized easier um, yeah, you're more, more likely to, to come into the group that is treated within three days after diagnosis. So th this population will not be the same as a population that is, is treated later on during the disease course. Just to give an example why it's very likely that, that there is bias in this study. And finally, um, in Nature Medicine, uh, a publication where 39 patients that received plasma were matched with uh, a group of controls to see if there is a, an effect. Um, and they found an effect that was so, so um, large that it, it really has to be biased. Look, look at the effect size, uh, the mortality in the plasma arm was like 20% and it was more than 50% in the control arm. And this more than 50% mortality is, is really not something that we're seeing now 
uh, in the hospital. So long, long story short, um, a lot of bias results, I think, led to the uncontrolled use of convalescent plasma in the USA in the hospital setting, which also has made recruitment in trials uh, more difficult there. But fortunately, other countries uh, have taken a different approach. Um, and I'm happy to, to, to be able to share you these results. We actually started a, a randomized clinical trial in the Netherlands uh, as of April, um, where we um, randomized 86 patients, um, which is not a large number, but you'll soon find out, find out where, uh, why this is the case. Um, and you have to also take into account that um, at that time we had a lot of questions and very few answers. Uh, so the design of the study was made with this lack of knowledge um, um, at that time. I'll come back to these questions later on. And, uh, but the most important were um, what would be the, the best timing of antibody therapy uh, what dose is needed, how do we have to select the best donors, um, so a lot of questions. Now, we randomized 86 patients and at, at that time, um, the results came back from our lab uh, about the antibody titers at baseline in these patients. These patients were hospitalized and received plasma or did not receive plasma because it was randomized as soon as possible after hospital admission. And the donors we selected were really, uh, I think, well selected because our lab, which is a coronavirus WHO reference lab, they were able to do the, the whole virus uh, neutralizing antibody titer measurement uh, in the lab. Um, so the donors we had, they had a, a median titer of 1 over 640, which is really high. I think 20% of the donors have this kind of titer and 80% have a lower titer. And despite the, the, the selection of these donors, um, the median titer in uh, our um, patients at baseline was not very different. Actually, 80% of the patients had antibodies at baseline. And if you look at this 80%, the titer was exactly the same as what we were uh, having in the donors. So that actually means that you were giving one unit of plasma, 300 ml, to, a, to an adult with three liter of plasma uh, in his own body. So you're, you're actually bringing water to the sea, I would say. Um, and in the few patients with little or no antibodies at baseline, we also saw a rapid increase in the titer. Um, so if you look at the, the red lines, these patients did not receive plasma and still their antibody titers increased rapidly after hospital admission and compar comparable to the intervention arm. So we, we did not see any clinical benefits uh, and also no, uh, not, not a faster decline in the viral um, uh, particles uh, that were excreted. Um, no benefit regarding inflammation markers. Um, so yeah. That's why we discontinued the study after 86 inclusions. Uh, of course, after we discussed this with the data safety monitoring board and the, the team members, it was a hard decision, but I think it was the, the, the right decision. And I, actually, I'm sure that it was uh, now uh, four months later, because um, several other clinical trials have now been uh, published first from China, but I, I'm going to skip this because these patients were really uh, very, very late in the disease course, 30 days after symptom onset. But more recent studies, uh, large studies, randomized patients um, on day eight after disease onset. And um, I'm going to focus on the letter that was published in the New England uh, a week or two ago, um, where they included patients uh, in the hospital, not in the ICU, um, sick patients with low saturation or, uh, or in need of um, yeah, oxygen. Eventually 228 received plasma and 106 received uh, placebo, which, which was saline. Um, 
And good to know is that these patients already received uh, what, what, what is now considered the standard of care, corticosteroid therapy. Um, and here again, to make a long story short, there was no uh, benefit whatsoever uh, with plasma. Um, the odds ratio was 3.8, where a, an odds ratio above one would be uh, uh, beneficial. So no evidence whatsoever that it's uh, helping the patient. And also good to see, or good to see, in for, uh, it's, it's um, an observation that we made as well, is that also in the placebo arm, antibody titers were increasing very rapidly after hospital admission. So my conclusion regarding plasma therapy in hospitalized patients is that um, yeah, you're, you're giving plasma too late because antibody formation has started in the majority um, and in the, the few patients that are not yet forming antibodies at baseline, they will start doing it uh, almost all within a week after admission. So viral replication is not the problem anymore in these patients. It is, as we now all know, uh, inflammation and um, coagulation uh, that is the problem. There is one exception, uh, the immunocompromised patient that is hospitalized, that's a different situation and there um, my conclusions can be different. I'll come back to that actually uh, in a minute. <clears throat> so you could say, uh, why not close the books entirely on plasma or antibody-based therapy? Well, very recently, there have uh, uh, new data have emerged that I think are promising. Um, and I'll show you these data. First of all, um, a study from our virology lab. Um, what they did already some months ago is they um, used the hamster COVID model and they uh, administered human plasma from our donors in different uh, doses. So there was a, an arm of animals that received plasma with very high titers. This is really uh, the top 5% uh, uh, titer in donors. Another group received a relatively low titer, which is, is not low, but it's, yeah, it's low compared with this high titer, of course. And then there was control plasma as well. These animals received plasma, and then very soon after that, they were exposed to the virus. So it's a prophylaxis uh, trial. And what you can see is that high titers protected the animals from becoming sick. That's the blue line. Um, and um, yeah, low titers or no uh, antibody titers. So control plasma did not protect the animals. So that's something that it shows that antibodies can really have a therapeutic effect or at least a prophylactic effect. And then there is another patient group that really for me is, is uh, Show, showing where we, we can generate data uh, showing that antibody therapy can be uh, a, a, value, a valuable treatment. These are the patients that have no B cells, so they are not able to form antibodies themselves, typically because they have been treated with rituximab. And then they get COVID and they remain sick for a very long time or uh, do not survive the, the infection. We've been... Um, treating 15 patients um, like these with plasma. And we, we were, um, before we, we gave them plasma, we really tested um, them uh, and, and documented that they, they remained antibody negative, um, which makes sense, of course, because they have no B cells. Um, and please uh, take into account that these patients were sick for a very long time. The median was six weeks, and some of them had been sick and PCR positive and being yeah, at home with fever for, for three months. We, give, we gave them three units of plasma, and the typical uh, pattern that we see is a very rapid recovery within a week. Um, here, for instance, you see uh, yeah, data from the first seven patients where inflammation is really going down after a transfusion. And here you see that they all were antibody negative at baseline and that the two units of plasma seems to be a, um, yeah, a correct dose in my 
opinion, they all zero converted and also remain zero converted for at least uh, two weeks. And also the, the CT scan improved, um, yeah, really uh, nicely after one week. Um, so we continue to use plasma in these uh, very yeah, specific patients. Then finally, uh, what are also data that I think show what the potential is of plasma, but if you give it uh, at the right time in the right patient. Um, this is a study published, uh, I think six weeks ago now in the New England, where a monoclonal antibody um, that is now called bamlinivimab, um, where this was given to patients within the first week of illness, so outpatients, um, and this study was actually a dose finding study, but you have to take into account that also the low dose group received uh, antibodies that should be more than enough uh, to have a, a therapeutic effect. So patients very early in their disease, disease course. And there, <clears throat> a very interesting observation was made that the admission rates after inclusion in the study went from 6% to 1.5% uh, if you compare the intervention with control arm. So that's really uh, what we were hoping to see. And um, that actually led to the FDA authorization of the use of bemlanivimab uh, in this patient population. And they, here you also see what the effect is in the high risk outpatient group. So, uh, what I think is a dramatic reduction in, in hospital uh, visits and hospitalizations. And an identical observation was made, uh, I think, two or three weeks ago with uh, the monoclonal antibodies from Regeneron and the same reduction in, in hospital uh, uh, visits and admissions was observed from 9 to 3%. So this really shows that if you give antibody-based therapy in the right patient at the right time, that it may help. But um, there is um, also, uh, there was also an observation that um, led to the discontinuation of antibody uh, of, of a study in hospitalized patients that were critically ill, so high flow oxygen or mechanical ventilation, because their treatment with the monoclonal antibody may be um, unfavorable. So the timing is crucial. And this also illustrates that the use of convalescent plasma in the hospital setting may still be harmful um, because the data are not, uh, there are not enough data to really, to, to conclude with certainty that in, in for instance, ICU patients, uh, treatment with plasma um, is worse than no treatment with the plasma. So I think that it, in a hospital setting, it should only be used uh, in the context of a clinical trial or one exception in patients that really are proven to, to have no antibody formation themselves. So some answers that we now have on the questions that I, that I, I showed you in the beginning of my presentation. Um, the timing of the antibody formation we now know. Um, <clears throat> we also now know that we really should select the donors carefully uh, and how you should do that. I think a combination of first an ELISA screening assay and then a, a, a plaque reduction neutralization assay, so a, a virus neutralization assay may be the best approach. And what we still do not know very well is what the, the best dose of antibodies and plasma is. And regarding the timing, I think the earlier the battle, the better is now really the conclusion. There are a lot of uh, ongoing trials on plasma, just uh, to illustrate this with one slide. Um, and my final um, slides will be uh, about a study that we're now uh, doing that started like six weeks ago, where we really focus on the outpatient uh, within the first week of symptoms. Um, 
There, we randomize patients uh, to convalescent plasma or fresh chosen plasma as a control. These patients are um, sick for no more than seven days, and they are at higher risk of a bad outcome because they're older or they have comorbidities. Um, these patients can um, contact us uh, via a website, and then we invite them to one of the participating hospitals they are transfused and then they go back home and we call them to to yeah detect their outcome so the risk factors that we use for the patients below the age of 70 uh, are these uh, but they these may change over the the course of the study it's a it's a blinded study so the the dsmb can advise us to be more stringent um, and more recently, an amendment was, was approved where we now also include immunocompromised patients because we know that they have a, yeah, a higher risk for a bad outcome. The primary endpoint is a score from one to five. Um, and we choose this to make the study as simple as possible because you can score this uh, uh, via a telephone call. Um, and we need 690 patients to um, to have it to have a sufficiently powered study um, which is a lot and it's challenging but the study is 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 recruiting uh, better and better so very simple patient um, contacts us or the, the his general uh, gp or another physician contacts us about the patient uh, we contact the patient and if he or she is willing to participate um, she or he gets an invitation uh, and comes to the hospital the next day, and then it's a, a telephone call. Now, for, for these kind of studies, uh, communication is really crucial, and I, I've actually feeling uh, I've been feeling more like a lobbyist rather than a scientist these days. Um, we invest a lot of time and also money in, in getting the study uh, in public, um, getting the public know the study, and. The, the, the incidence of COVID-19 is highest in the hardest to reach patients. So that's really challenging. So, um, for instance, we made a website and this is a website where the patient can, can contact us. And uh, very recently, we also added um, Arabic language, English language, uh, and, and a, a short uh, YouTube uh, movie to inform the patients. So we do a lot to get to, to get to mess to get the message to the to the patient. So um, if this would have been a pro-com debate, I would say um, con the use of convalescent plasma in hospitalized patients outside the context of a trial. Certainly con in ICU patients, maybe except for the B cell depleted patient. Pro um, in patients preceding hospital admission before day eight, of, eight to 10 of symptoms, but in a randomized clinical trial setting. In B cell depleted patients, maybe difficult to do it in a randomized trial. Um, and in otherwise immunocompromised patients, I think it's, it's also reasonable to, to use antibody based therapy, but then first really document that they remain antibody negative. Um, 10 days or more after disease onset. So that's uh, the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bart, for that comprehensive overview. I certainly had not appreciated how complicated this field is or how complicated that data is that is training in India and completed in the United States um, and now has um, an extensive research interest in the area of emerging diseases and mass critical care. Over to you Vikram. All right good morning and good afternoon to all those who have taken the time to attend this session and thank you for coming. Now, over the next 20 minutes or so we'll cover the disease spectrum, the clinical disease spectrum that COVID-19 can cause. Uh, in terms of introductions, my name is Vikram Mukherjee. I'm an intensive care physician based out of New York Hospital, uh, where I direct the medical ICU. And I'm also the medical director of our 
special pathogens program here at Bellevue Hospital. I have no relevant financial disclosures here. And as we go into the clinical aspects of COVID-19 and how SARS-CoV-2 affects the human body, I think it's relevant to just remind ourselves of the biphasic response that is often seen translated to clinical illness at the bedside. Um, as we know by now, there's an initial vir viral or a viremic phase, which is usually stage one and stage two, followed by a, a aggravated host uh, response, which usually manifests itself, as you see on this diagram, in stage two and stage three. And it's good to remind ourselves of this biphasic response because the treatment modalities, the clinical um, uh, findings that we see at the bedside are often pertinent to where in the phase the patient presents himself or herself. Um, just going over the different ways that uh, SARS-CoV-2 can affect a, a patient, there is all the way from asymptomatic or presymptomatic all the way down to critical illness. And just going over some basic features, an asymptomatic or presymptomatic patient, which is up to 30% of patients who have this infection, are have no symptoms whatsoever, no fever, no cough. Uh, a screening test, if the patient has had known exposure, is often positive and the patient is recommended to be isolated, of course. Um, this is clinically challenging because from a public health perspective, um, given that around 30% of patients will have no symptoms at the time of infectiousness, makes contact tracing quite difficult. And that's one of the challenges that every public health department across the world might be facing as we speak. Going on, there's mild illness, which is honestly just a little bit of fever, a bit of cough, anosmia. Testing again is diagnostics testing and isolation is recommended. Moderate illness is when we have a patient who has a low risk for uh, infection, either an extra with some infiltrates or granulose opacities or not further imaging, but the patient is not hypoxic and possibly can be taken care of at home. The two latter categories, severe illness and critical illnesses, where in-hospital medicine comes into context. Severe illness, as defined by the WHO, um, is a hypoxia to less than 94%, tachypnea, lung infiltrates more than 50%, and while critical illness is the other end of the spectrum where you have respiratory failure, often requiring intubation, proning ECMA, shock with multi-organ failure. And this is where not just the viral response, but also the host immune response plays a significant role in uh, the clinical manifestations. Of course, testing overall is di diagnostics testing. And anytime you have a positive test, isolation to prevent further uh, uh, infection and further spread is advocated for. Now, again, here is uh, the viral replication phase. The first three or four categories is where there's viremia. The, the last two or three categories is where the host immune system becomes dysregulated and plays a, a significant role in the, in the clinical spectrum. And again, following these four or five categories, it's important to know that where the patient lies Early on, when there's active viremia, viral replication, antiviral therapy, especially FDA-approved remdesivir, has a significant role to play. Early on, especially in the outpatient setting, when there is still uh, an asymptomatic or mild illness, moderate illness phase, an antibody therapy uh, has been shown to have a decrease in ED visits and hospitalizations. In the fourth and fifth phase, where severe illness and critical illness have a much uh, are manifestations and the host immune system is um, playing a significant role, is where anti-inflammatory therapy, for example, steroids, have a significant role to play and has data to show that it might improve outcomes. Again, uh, going over the last row here, the first one, where you are asymptomatic and presymptomatic, is mostly about infection control and public health contact tracing. Uh, mild, moderate, and severe illness is clinical monitoring, supportive care. Severe illness is usually when hospitalization is advocated for supportive care with oxygen therapy, specific therapy such as remdesivir and dexamethasone. And when you have critical illness with multi-organ failure, need for intubation, or especially renal failure, this is when the patient enters into the ICU and often almost gets steroids and possibly remdesivir as an antiviral agent. But the point I'm trying to make in this very busy slide is that we as clinicians have to recognize that there are now five different categories of illness and the challenges faced are different uh, compared to in context of where the patient is. If it's here, the first phase, it's mostly the, the patient will, should be okay. It's most, mostly about contract tracing and isolation and social uh, and isolation. While in terms of critical illness, it's more of an ICU supportive care uh, paradigm where critical care support and specific therapy are mainstays of treatment. <laughs>
Um, so following this trajectory, there are different ways that patients can present. One is onset of symptoms and the patient recovers, to, uh, does just fine. The patient may be sick enough to present to the ER and at that point can get admitted to the floor or to home. Once the patient is discharged home, a, little, a period of monitoring following which the patient uh, is usually recovers and gets better. The patient may be admitted to the floor following which usually recovery happens and then the patient goes home. However, a significant fraction continue to develop and progress to critical illness, worsening hypoxia, admitted to the ICU, most commonly with the bilateral infiltrates meeting classic criteria for severe acute respiratory distress syndrome. Many of them, because of the dysregulated host, host immune response, progress to a cytokine storm. Uh, and among all the organs that fail uh, in our ICU's renal failure, new onset AKI requiring renal replacement therapy was by far the most common. And sometimes the patient recovers, off and on, unfortunately, when multi organ failure sets in, that is an unfortunate terminal uh, uh, next event. Um, and honestly, the challenge we face now that we know that there are different trajectories of how a patient can manifest is try to delineate which patients will do better and go home with full recovery, which patients will be admitted to the ICU and develop severe acute respiratory distress syndrome, which uh, with requirements for high flow nasal cannula, with requirements for intubation, proning, and often on ECMO, which patients will require renal replacement therapy and uh, have overall poor outcome. So now that we have somewhat of an experience with this disease and we have been acquainted with SARS-CoV-2 for almost a year now, it's uh, time for us to use some clinical tools to help differentiate uh, oral outcomes in terms of recovery versus ICU admission and death. Um, many risk factors play into these outcomes. Um, there are clinical risk factors and non-clinical risk factors, and I want to put in, you know, describe a little bit about the non-clinical risk factors, which have so much to play in how a patient does. So here's New York City data, and as you can see here, uh, patients who uh, belong to a uh, Hispanic or Latino uh, or uh, overall an underserved, underrepresented minority do much worse than patients who are traditionally a non-Hispanic white. So for example, this is rate per 100,000 population in terms of hospitalizations. People who are of uh, color, people who are of underrepresented minorities have a higher rate of hospitalization and severe disease than people who are not. This trend continues in New York City, for example, people who are generally underrepresented and of color have a higher rate of cases, have a higher rate of hospitalizations, and have a higher rate of death. So just being of a certain ethnic and racial background puts a patient at a higher risk of death, hospitalization, and infection uh, compared to being of uh, Caucasian descent. Now, there are many, many factors playing under, uh, under this discrepancy. One, uh, we strongly feel that COVID-19 magnifies the social disparities that already exist in healthcare access and healthcare delivery. Um, secondly, as you can imagine, one of the principles of good contract tracing and social isolation is being able to work from home. And many people of color may not have that luxury of being able to work from home and are compelled to go to work and get exposed to potential infection. And lastly, we're looking at it closely, but there might be a genetic predisposition of patients who are of color to get a, a severe form of this disease. But to cut the point, to cut the story short, if you are a person of color, you're already more predisposed to being infected, being hospitalized with severe or critical disease, or dying uh, from uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. More interestingly is, especially in New York City, COVID-19 cases, hospitalization deaths by poverty level. And again, this underlines the emphasis on social disparities and access to healthcare. If you live in an area which has a very high poverty level, you're more likely to be infected, more likely to be hospitalized, and more likely to die of SARS-CoV-2. And again, the, the reasons underlying this are similar to what we spoke in the earlier slide. Access to healthcare, ability to self-isolate, uh, and uh, social distance are much more constrained when you come to people living in uh, high to very high poverty levels. Um, what's very interesting is this paper that came out last week from NYU, which shows that um, the proportion outcomes of patients with COVID-19 by recent ethnicity and essentially, if you, once you're admitted to the hospital, your outcomes are very similar, irrespective of whether you're white, non-Hispanic, 
black non-Hispanic, Hispanic, Asian non-Hispanic, or multiracial. So it's essentially the social disparities are more of healthcare access than healthcare delivery. And this is important to know that when you are in the ICU, for example, your chances of dying are actually very similar across multiple uh, you know, races and ethnicities. Uh, so it's very interesting that the discrepancy that we see here is more about healthcare access than healthcare delivery per se. Moving on to clinical risk factors, um, as you saw from those two uh, algorithms in the previous slides, the patients can either remain completely asymptomatic, have a mild or moderate form of illness and recover with 100% baseline functional status versus a much more severe or critical illness route where the patients uh, either stay in the hospital and require supplemental oxygen, end up with fibrotic lung disease, or end up in the ICU and recover not to the complete um, baseline that they came in with, but to a, to a part of it or die of SARS-CoV-2. And this underlines the need for predictive scores. It would be immensely helpful for us as clinicians on the front lines to know that, yes, this patient is gonna recover, can go home. Yes, this patient is not gonna do so well and needs closer monitoring in the ICU. Or even more importantly, this patient, come what may, is not gonna do well, has a 90% mortality, and, the, and resources should be targeted more towards goals of care discussions rather than aggressive ECMO and other uh, state-of-the-art critical uh, interventions. So the need for predictive scores are three in number, identify high-risk patients so we can keep a closer eye on them, um, pre-deterioration escalation of care so that we don't wait for them to be hypoxic or peri-arrest before we escalate them to an ICU. And this is relevant in COVID-19 because escalation of care, as you can imagine, takes time. Uh, you have to don your PPE, you have to go into the room. It takes an extra seven or eight minutes to address an escalation of care. And those seven, eight minutes when dealing with an unstable patient can mean a significant uh, uh, difference between life and death. And goals of care discussions, you know. So for example, if you know that a patient, come what may, has close to 100% mortality, those are patients that we should involve our palliative care exports and our intensivists to discuss goals of care rather than go down a, a route of aggressive critical care intervention. This has relevance in search planning where you're trying to um, uh, protect your beds to critically ill patients who would benefit most by critically, critical interventions. So in, in this context comes a beautiful score published in the BMJ in September called the 4C score. It takes into context these eight parameters, age, sex. We know that older age patients with an older age do poorly. We know that patients who are of male gender or male sex do worse than uh, case control uh, patients of female gender. Number of comorbidities, especially hypertension, obesity, diabetes. Uh, respiratory rate and uh, oxygen sats, which give you an insight of how compromised the patient's respiratory status is. Uh, GCS, encephalopathy, uh, BUN as a marker of renal failure, uh, and CRP as a marker of the patient's uh, host immune system that, has been, that might have gotten dysregulated by now. So taking these eight uh, parameters into context comes a very elegant 4C score, which has a really good predictive value in being able to provide, in being able to predict mortality and ICU outcomes. So here on the left is an AUROC curve, which compares the 4C score here with a curve 65 with just age and with a 50-50 coin toss. And as you can see here, the 4C score outperforms most of most well uh, validated scores in terms of being able to predict poor ice poor outcomes in terms of good sensitivity and good specificity. On the right here is another reflection of the same score. Uh, it ha and shows the discriminative performance of, of the score to predict in hospital mortality. And as you can see here, uh, the 4C mortality score has around a 77% predictive value in being able to do that. And this is very comparable compared to something that we've been use, using for uh, years, the COOP 65 or SOFA score and so forth. So something that has promising data in it and uh, in my mind should be used in patients who are being admitted to the hospital to risk stratify them on whether they'll be doing, better, doing well and going home, whether they'll do poorly and come to the ICU. Um, Moving along this, you know, earlier we thought that, especially in Jan and January and February of this year, we thought that uh, SARS-CoV-2 was a predominantly respiratory infection. And yes, that's usually the case when uh, it starts off, but as things get worse, um, SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19 quickly involves multiple other uh, organ systems. As you can see here, 
acute respiratory distress syndrome is by far the most common manifestations, but acute kidney injury, we know from our spring experience that up to 30% of patients in the ICU had AKI uh, were bad enough to necessitate renal replacement therapy. And this took us off guard because we were looking at the surge capacity in terms of ventilators and so forth. We were not as conversant with the amount of renal replacement therapy that these patients will need. Um, stroke um, coming along with venous thromboembolism, a uh, sign that SARS-CoV-2 infection is highly hypercoagulable for multiple, multiple pathways. All three of the workhouse triad seems to get activated from uh, the endothelial inflammation that SARS-CoV-2 uh, can cause. Uh, so strokes and uh, venous, th venous thromboembolism are big uh, manifestations of SARS of this infection in an extrapulmonary fashion. Vasoplegic shock, mostly from this uh, cytokine, cytokine release syndrome that is being debated now. And of course, this dysregulated host response, which often causes the vasoplegia as well as uh, high inflammatory markers. Um, with that, I will pause for questions. Thank you for time. Again, the take home points that I would like to uh, urge from this is that uh, SARS CoV 2 COVID and infections can cause a uh, um, uh, large the spectrum of disease, most of your patients will do just fine. They might not even be symptomatic. And the challenges there are social isolation, our distancing, our case control. A small fraction, but not. Uh, but given how large this pandemic is, the numbers are still very significant. Will require hospitalization. Will require ICU resources. And it's really important that we as clinicians are able to discern which of these patients will do better and go home, which of these patients will need a closer eye and will need to be monitored throughout the ICU stay. With that, I will pause. Thank you for your time. and look forward to hearing any questions from you. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mukherjee, for that excellent presentation. And we now have a couple of questions that have come in um, from all of you. And um, feel free to keep on asking. Um, but some of these questions are essentially, I'm going to start with Dr. Kritzkis um, on, um, on remdesivir, um, which is that, are there any data about remdesivir usage during pregnancy? Uh, there are data from the um, compassionate use protocol, uh, which allowed uh, the use of remdesivir in women with, who are pregnant. Uh, I'm not aware that those data have actually been analyzed and published to date. Um, but certainly uh, in the spring surge, uh, there was uh, remdesivir use, including at our center at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, uh, and, and, but it's in a handful of patients. Uh, I don't know, Vikram might have uh, more uh, experience as well in New York City. Um, thanks, Dr. Kuritsky. So uh, we don't have a, we haven't treated a lot of patients uh, who are pregnant or uh, uh, children with remdesivir yet. So I'd love to see any data that comes out. If I may, this is Johan uh, I know that in the Ebola studies that uh, newborn babies have been treated uh, with remdesivir and that, that was quite well tolerated. Hmm. Okay, and a um, couple of other questions um, that actually many of you could answer. Um, so I'll leave it sort of up to you. But essentially, if you were to say the perfect treatment for moderate COVID-19, so say... Um, you know, a family, you're advising a family of a patient with moderate COVID-19 in your care. They have access to any drug of their choice. <laughs> what would you, what would you advise them? And, and, you know, I think the remdesivir uh, data here will be of relevance. I'll, I'll start, I guess. I, I think, you know, for the patient who doesn't require hospitalization, I would uh, recommend a, a clinical trial, either BART's trial or, uh, you know, a study looking at um, one of the um, monoclonal antibodies that are now being tested. There are also some oral agents that are beginning to go into trial in, uh, in people with um, moderate disease. I think it changes if you require hospitalization and we can uh, argue about whether that's already m still moderate or more severe disease, but that's when I begin to think that you really should be using remdesivir. And certainly if you have an oxygen requirement, steroids, which is the best therapy in terms of data for the mortality difference. Okay, thank you. Um, actually, this is, a, this is more of a, 
question about convalescent plasma, and it was sort of answered, um, and it it's relevant to the monoclonal antibodies as well. But as you know, the ACIP recommended that wait 90 days after convalescent plasma or monoclonal antibodies. Can you explain if that really needs to be done? Um, uh, and I know that there were some answers in the chat, but it'd be great to hear that out loud if you really think that's necessary. Maybe Bart should. Respond. Yeah, Bart, please. Sorry. Yeah. After convalescent plasma and now the vaccine's here and someone's been mm -hmm. treated, um, can we give the vaccine earlier than 90 days? Well, with, certainly with the monoclonal antibodies, I would, I would indeed uh, wait uh, because these, these have been selected to to yeah, be well dosed and have a, a therapeutic concentration for, for at least a month and probably longer. Uh, and animal models at least show that they also prevent disease. So uh, I, 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 I would indeed wait. So I agree with the three months um, regarding convalescent plasma therapy. That's, that's more difficult to predict because you, you, you're not knowing which titer you're using in each patient. So um, I think there as well, from a pragmatic point of view, um, I would wait. But the good news is that all these patients will have received these therapies because they had COVID. So probably, or maybe they, they don't need any vaccination at all anymore. At least the ACIP came out on, on that and said, um, Definitely natural immunity will last a while, but they gave it kind of 90 days um, yeah. and then Makes a vaccine. Sense. And the way they said it is it's sort of optional, if at least for the for the ACIP said optional to wait those 90 days. But because you're exactly right, that that reinfection so rare within that time. Um, OK, so a couple of other questions that are very interesting. I mean, I think this is to put this diff a little differently. Um, the cytokine storm issue, or, or es seriously, uh, essentially massive inflammation um, in severe respiratory insufficiency versus having a large viral load. And so essentially, given the remdesivir study, could we hypothesize that inflammation is the main, um, is really the main driver of severe illness as opposed to it being related to a large viral load, which then an antiviral would be even more effective than dexamethasone. So I think this is a question actually for all of you, but for Vikram and, and, and Dan, maybe in particular. Hi, Dr. Gandhi, would you like me to uh, go first? Yes, please, thank you. Thank you, that's a great question. And uh, uh, yes, I think, uh, you know, there is a component of both. Uh, either we have viral pneumonia and viral ARDS on the early uh, part of the disease course, but that uh, that also happens very quickly in the second half of the disease course when you have the host immune response. My personal inclination would be it's most likely from the host immune response that we have the massive inflama inflammation in the ARDS, uh, because that's why steroids seem to have some effect. Um, if it was solely from the viremia and viral replications, then steroids would probably have a counterproductive effect in, in making things worse. But because there's such a dysregulated host immune system, we feel that steroids uh, help and uh, that uh, the dysregulation might need to be brought under control that way. Yeah, I think that the um, situations become more complicated than we first uh, imagined because there are, as, as we've gotten better at doing quantitative virology, it's clear there is a subset of patients, particularly those with severe disease who continue to have high levels of virus in their respiratory secretions. Now, to what extent that repli represents ongoing replication that can really be uh, inhibited by drug is, is another question because clearly uh, the studies have all shown that the antivirals are, are far less effective in, in the most severely ill patients. And so there's a bit of a, of a disconnect there. If, if I may, I would like to add to that, that of course, I mean, the antivirals that we have at hand are not really potent. Uh, remdesivir is not potent, uh, favipiravir is uh, not potent, uh, molnupiravir not, is not potent. They all work to some extent, in, uh, at least in animal models, but not, not potent. If you compare that to, for example, the highly potent hepatitis C drugs that we have and the highly potent HIV drugs, which have often nanomolecular, even picomolecular potencies, 
uh, this is nothing compared to what we have for HIV, which uh, for um, <laughs> SARS-CoV-2, where we have uh, for uh, favipiravir something like 100 microvilli, uh, and even remdesivir is, I mean, well, depending on cell line, but still, I mean, these are not potent compounds. And so I think if you would have, and of course, many teams, including us, are working on developing highly potent compounds, that may be a whole different story at the time that, I mean, if you have such drugs at hand, uh, that you could then maybe hopefully uh, at a later stage still go in into patients um, and still see a beneficial effect. Certainly agree. But there will be I time think, needed to, uh, to develop such drugs, of course. I think actually a great follow-up to what you just said then, Johan, is this, um, that someone has asked um, that they routinely in their center use favipravir uh, yeah. for COVID-19. So two... One thousand one sixteen hundred milligram loading, and then followed by twelve hundred milligram maintenance. And what do you think um, in terms of those doses being enough to achieve virologic suppression? Well, as, as I presented, I mean we have data in hamsters, and hamsters are not humans. But the uh, the, the with, with the high dose, so we do a one thousand two hundred milligram per kilogram uh, loading dose in hamsters, and then a, a one thousand uh, milligram per kilogram dosing for the next couple of days. Uh, we do see a clear effect and the concentrations that we get of the drug in, in, uh, in, in plasma is uh, are comparable to those that are achieved in, uh, in the, were achieved in the Ebola studies. Um, so this so center is routinely uh, doing it, it sounds like, um, yeah. at 1,200 a day. Yeah. Okay. Again, again, it, it, it's not a potent drug, but at least each little bit of inhibition of, of replication that you can achieve may be a bonus. Um, um, so this is a question. Oh, sorry. Can I just add? Please, yeah, please. What I was really su surprised to see is, is that the, the virus neutralizing antibody titers in the very sick ICU patients uh, really on the day of ICU admission are typically really extremely high. So they are eventually the best donors. So it seems like like a viral replication is getting under control in these very sick patients. Yeah. Um, so that's just a remark. And then maybe a question to to you and maybe to Johan in particular. Um, do you think that that the, the nasopharyngeal swab and is is the 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 right place to to look at antiviral response in humans because maybe it may not represent what is ongoing in the lungs. Uh, no, but it's the most easy way to assess it, of course, if you need to take ball uh, to assess um, this day by day, that's perhaps not the, um, the most optimal way to, to do it. Um, so, yeah, it's that is difficult, difficult to say. Yeah. yeah, I mean, practically speaking, the only people who really get serial um, sputum or uh, bronchoalveolar lavage samples from are those who are the sickest and have been intubated, which, of course, is a huge uh, yeah. bias. Uh, right there. So this is specifically a question for you, um, uh, Vikram, which is, um, do you think there are any uh, other differences beyond the social determinants of health uh, uh, that have led to the poor outcomes among racial and ethnic minorities here? Um, and and the, the questioner is specifically asking about um, African Blacks um, in, in Africa, but do you think it is all sort of related to all of our disparities that we have in this country? I think, uh, Laura Gandhi, that's a great question. And um, I think we're still learning about this. There's definitely a role, a huge role to play uh, with the socioeconomic disparities that make not only hospitals in certain communities more overwhelmed than other hospitals and the ICU strain that comes with it, but also, uh, for example, the absence of social distancing and the ability to work from home that plays into that. Um, that last paper I mentioned in my talk, which says that once you're admitted to the hospital, every person of every color does just the same, is kind of an eye-opener, which says that it's not about you or the healthcare that's delivered, it's more about healthcare access, at least in New York City, and many of the cosmopolitan areas of the, uh, of the world, maybe. So in my mind, I'm leaning more towards healthcare access than actual genetic variations in predisposition. But I think uh, this evidence will evolve over time. I think those data are really quite consistent with the, an analysis that came out of a, a multi-center uh, 
study uh, published over the summer that uh, uh, I think it was Gupta et al. with, um, I'm forgetting the senior author, uh, but they looked at a database uh, of uh, 20 or 30 centers. These were all ICU patients. And, and again, showed, and this was in JAMA Internal Medicine, I believe, uh, showed that once you got into the ICU, race and ethnicity were not a factor in survival. So, so um, I think this question could be more towards Barb, but um, uh, please, uh, if anyone else wants to answer, do you think once pneumonia is established in the lungs that convalescent plasma monoclonal antibodies are still useful? I don't think they're useful at that time. So, yeah, even, unless you're, you're B cell depleted. It's really preventing yeah, that it's from happening. Very early onset. And of course, somebody within the first seven days can have infiltrates, but uh, typically they, they do not have extensive infiltrates. Uh, but once in the hospital with uh, extensive infiltrates on the chest X ray, I would not uh, use convalescent plasma. I would say even even the most optimistic trials and observational studies have shown no benefit of uh, convalescent plasma in uh, in uh, ventilated patients. Yeah. So we do have to end, but um, I will actually end with a kind of controversial question. It's more on the remdesivir front, but um, we know that WHO on November twentieth. Um, really recommended against it and cited cost as a barrier. And this participant who is in the African setting is asking what to do about that $1,200 cost, uh, $1,200, at least that's how much it costs in Africa. As the IDSA, on the other hand, came down strongly that it's worth um, the benefit. So I, I don't know if anyone wants to make a comment on cost in Africa and the WHO guidelines on November 20th. Well, I, I can make a comment about uh, why I think WHO and IDSA uh, differ in their perspectives. And it's really a different way of uh, how we uh, assess treatment outcomes, right? Everybody's in agreement that none of the trials show remdesivir has a mortality benefit. And so if you are in a resource constrained setting where you're going to invest your greatest uh, dollars and uh, focus your interventions on those proven to improve survival, then corticosteroids are, are the way to go. Uh, in a system where every day spent in the hospital costs the system a huge amount of money, every day saved uh, is a big savings to the system. And that's why I think in the United States, particularly, there's been a focus on the uh, you know, the three or four days uh, uh, earlier discharge that you get with remdesivir. That's not the case in Canada, for example, where they have not uh, embraced remdesivir in the same way that we have. So it, it depends very much on your healthcare system. That completely makes sense. Thank you very much, everyone, and everyone's great talks. And I think we're just going to end up with the closing slide that Dr. Venter will go over. Thank you. And uh, just to thank Monica for moderating that, as well as to to acknowledge Monica's huge role in science advocacy within her own country and beyond over the last little while. We're going to see great things from you going forward. So thank you to our four speakers. That was a wonderful session. Um, and yeah, that was a real tour de force. Um, we've got this, another amazing session tomorrow. So I hope you'll all join us at the times up there on the, on the screen. Um, again, we've got excellent speakers, we've got great moderators, and I hope you have a lot of fun tomorrow evening joining us again. So thank you, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and we'll chat to you soon. Cheers. <laughs>